good mm-hmm. afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you. you it's, it's a pleasure to be back in person again uh, and just to be able to engage in important fellowship. So thanks for coming. So as some of you know, I'm a Marshall Memorial Fellow. I serve on the Board of Trustees for the U.S. German Marshall Fund, and I'm the former chairman of the Board of Councilors at the Carter Center, like Catherine said. Civil society, the transatlantic relationship, NATO, and po- the post-World War II rules-based order that enabled countries to respect borders and settle disagreements and disputes diplomatically rather than through war or violence are near and dear to me. With Russia blowing up the longest period of peace in the history of Europe, more than 70 years, by invading Ukraine illegally and without justification on February 24th, a day that none of us should ever forget, Putin reshuffled the geopolitical map in ways that were incomprehensible a few weeks ago. Just a few examples. Germany's pivot on defense given its history. And that's something that I think you should let sink in. Um, It is a big deal for them to have committed to allocate 2% of their budget in accordance with NATO standards towards defense and take on some of the other things they're going to do just given their, their, their history in World War II. Um, Europe's decision to wean itself off Russian energy, which seemed to be so obvious to all of us for years, and now it took a war for them to finally do that. The UK's moves to lead the way and seize Russian oligarchic assets, despite its close relationships with them. Hungary and Poland, Hungary and Poland stepping up in spite of their recent domestic rollbacks of democratic principles and rights. Article 4 being exercised and NATO deploying its rapid response force, which is a first for both. And then, of course, deployment of U.S. forces in numbers that have never been seen before to shore up Europe's eastern flanks. And those are just a few. So it's my privilege to introduce Larry Sampler, a former Green Beret and Georgia Tech alum, who's going to speak to us during one of the most challenging times we've faced since World War II. Having served as a senior government official in both Republican and Democratic administrations, Larry has lived and and worked in half a dozen conflict zones overseas. He has been in the U.S. military, Departments of Defense and State, USAID, the United Nations Peacekeeping Missions, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and also for both for-profit and non-profit organizations. Through his governance work in post-conflict zones, Larry has helped countries maintain peace through implementation of effective governance to peace models, which are clearly um, under threat right now. So we're very fortunate to have Larry share his observations about how the United States and our allies can pursue war and peace in the 21st century, and some of the challenges and opportunities we face as Americans, as global citizens, and as a country. So please give a hearty welcome Uh, yeah, good. The um, first thing I have to do is thank you for having me back. The, um, the opportunity to speak in Atlanta is a great one for me. I'm from here, and it gives me the chance to have both my dad and my son here. So um, I, it doesn't happen often with as much as I've traveled around the world. I've been gone more than I've been here. And in addition, Dr. Richard Bark from Georgia Tech is one of the mentors who is probably just thrilled I graduated. So to think of me ever in front of a group like this um, is, is beyond the kin for, for most of my professors. I have to say, y'all are a tough, tough crowd because there are so many people from so many different backgrounds with so many different perspectives. And so one of the things I think we'll agree on are my two chair drill, and I'll do it very quickly so we can get to the meat of the program. One chair is to keep us grateful. There are men and women all over the world who are literally fighting and dying as we sit at lunch um, to guarantee the rights to freedom uh, for people like us so that we can assemble, so that we can speak our minds, so that we can worship as we choose, so that we can marry who we choose. And it reminds me that I now have the privilege of no longer being in the trenches but of coming and doing things like this because, as I think it was Orwell said, brave men stand ready to visit violence on those who would do us harm. We have people who are standing between us and the bad guys, and we need to be grateful. The other chair, and it's not as necessary in a group like this, is to keep me humble. In a room with more than two people, I am never the smartest person in the room, but I try actually to do my best to present things that will be new and a little bit different. So one of my colleagues in the international community likes to describe the U.S. approach to foreign policy as seven-year-olds on the soccer pitch. 
They follow the ball, but they don't necessarily see the big picture. So what I hope to do today is throw a few things out that will distract you from the ball, which we all know is Ukraine, and focus a little bit more on what's behind the scenes and what goes on beyond that. Let's see if I can do this. All right, so my background is a jack of all trades and a master of none. There are at least three universities up on the screen, two think tanks, three government agencies. I have, by no great feat of my own, had the privilege of working in this field for almost 30 years and of seeing it from every perspective. I've been an officer in the UN at a very senior diplomatic level. I've worked in the Organization for the Security and Cooperation of Europe at a senior level. And what that means is not that I'm better than people that haven't, it just means I've seen the dysfunction of these organizations in ways that other people maybe haven't. This is a rough outline of what I want to be able to talk about today, and I, I'm going to be <clears throat> as quick as I can because I do want to be able to do questions and answers. I have a scene setter that I'm going to very briefly read because I think it does a good job of both simplifying and then also complicating our discussions today. About 9.30 p.m., this is from February. About 9.30 p.m., the alarm was given. We children knew that sound and got up and dressed quickly to hurry down into our cellar. Some minutes later, we heard a horrible noise, the bombs. There were nonstop explosions. Our cell were filled with fire and smoke and was damaged. The lights went out and wounded people shouted dreadfully. In great fear, we struggled to leave the cellar. My mother and my older sister carried the big basket in which the twins were laying. With one hand, I grasped my younger sister, and with the other, I grasped the coat of my mother. We fled into another cellar, overcrowded with injured and distraught men, women, and children, shouting, crying, and praying. No light except some electric torches. We saw terrible things. Cremated adults shrunk to the size of small children, pieces of arms and legs, dead people, whole families burnt to death. Burning people ran to and fro, burnt coaches filled with civilian refugees, dead rescuers, and dead soldiers. Many were calling and looking for their children and families, and fire was everywhere. All the time, the hot wind of the firestorm threw people back into the burning houses they were trying to escape from. I will never forget. The point of this is that war is born on the backs of the people who suffer the war. We in the United States don't see that with the same immediacy as Europe. The steppes of Europe have seen war since time immemorial. We happen to benefit from oceans on two fronts and, and friendly nations to our north and south. People who live on the eastern parts of Europe don't have that benefit. So it simplifies it because war is horrible. We all know that, but just reading that is difficult. It complicates our life because that's not a story from Ukraine. That's a story from the Dresden firebombing in 1945. And the bombing was done by US and British aircraft. My point today is going to be war has shifted enormously since 1945. But in some ways, and for some people, Putin being one of them, it hasn't shifted in the ways that it has for us. So, our military budget is greater than the military budget of the next 11 countries combined. Um, I won't read you the names of the countries, but if you take the next 11 countries, our military budget is bigger than all of theirs. If you look at our military budget compared to our State Department budget, it is about 16 times larger. Our military budget is about 16 times larger than our diplomacy budget. Now, one of the points I'm going to make today is there's not a war and peace dichotomy here. War and peace are kind of like the ingredients of a cake. You can't unmix them and sort them out. When we're at war, we're still doing trying to get to peace, and when we're at peace, we are unfortunately still planning for war. Um, there's an old expression, if you have a hammer, every problem's a nail. When you have a $700 billion hammer, you really like problems that look like a nail, and you really hate it when the State Department says, yeah, this is maybe not the time for a hammer. You really want to be able to use that tool that you've built, and we do have one of the finest militaries in the world. So, there's a guy named um, Ambrose Bierce, was a Civil War veteran. He wrote a book called Devil's Dictionary, a famous four-star general who I adore, um, the only man I actually know who had a bookshelf in his bathroom. This was in place of prominence in his restroom. So if you're interested in some light reading, but still kind of pointed and relevant, Ambrose Bierce, Devil's Dictionary is what it's called. But in a little more uh, pointed note, and maybe a little more seriously, uh, Carl von Clausewitz, one of the most often quoted, seldom read or understood authors on war, he famously said, war is the continuation of diplomacy by other means. And even more impactful, um, Frederick the Great, who's the king of Prussia, and if you don't know him, he's the guy that Napoleon looked up to as a really sharp general. He actually said, diplomacy without military might is like music without instruments. 
So the integration of diplomacy, of peace, and war is inseparable. We can't have peace on one extreme and war on the other. They're mixed together. I'll add to that um, a, a diplomat from this part of the world, he was actually from Belarus, said that um, diplomacy is what you say to a mean dog when you're looking for a big stick. I think that fits a lot with what's been going on um, in Ukraine right now. I've got a few geeky slides, and this is the first of about four of them. You don't need to worry about the small words on this slide, and let me just go ahead and build it. The way the United States breaks things down is by operational plans, and there are six phases to a U.S. military operation. Shape is when you're trying to prevent the conflict, you're trying to get people to do the right thing for the right reasons. Doesn't involve any kind of warfare, doesn't involve anything kinetic. It's psychological operations, it's media operations, um, it's marketing. Deter is where you get a little more pointed. They begin to do things you don't want them to do, and you're trying to discourage those specific things. This is still not kinetic. It's heating up a little bit, so I changed the color to orange. You're a little more pointed in your messaging. Um, seize the initiative, dominate and stabilize are the phases of the war. Um, and again, I, there's a lot more that I won't go into in the interest of time, but those are the three that we think of as war. And what I want you to do is stretch your brain. And again, there's no war and peace, but there's this mix in the middle that's when the fighting is going on. And as quickly as possible, we want to get to stabilize and then enable the civilian government to do their thing, and then we're back to shape. So in a way, this is almost a spherical situation. We're, we're always trying to do shape, always throughout. And you can see from the way the chart builds, shape never goes away, it's always there underneath the kinetic operations. So in a time of war, peace, whenever you want, there's a guy named Abraham Maslow who in the 1950s, or, maybe, or actually 1940s, came out with a book called A uh, theory of human motivation. And he was actually just a psychologist, and they use this in schools all the time. But I use it pretty aggressively when we do post-conflict reconstruction, because this is the priority order of things we have to focus on. And again, I'm just going to build a slide really quickly and let you read it. If you go into Ukraine in months, weeks, whenever we can go back in, you'll start at the bottom of this pyramid and work your way up if you want to have any real sense of success, a real, any real hope of rebuilding that society. Now, it's not perfectly linear, and there's lots of sidetracks and recycles, and you go back and, but if you don't have somebody providing physiological needs and basic safety and security, you can't do the other things that you want to do. So what I've done here is I've overlaid the Maslavian hierarchy on the left with kind of a chart showing how the US government and the international community intervene in these post-conflict settings to stop the war and to do the things that allow us to meet those Maslavian needs. Over the top, you'll see a security presence. And you can think maybe about Afghanistan, think about the Balkan Wars. The Ukraine war is not there yet. But security presence is what makes the other things possible. And as time goes on, you start out with humanitarian assistance. That's putting people in tents. That's getting them out of the snow and out of the slush and keeping them warm and giving them food. Then you begin with recovery. That's letting them go back to their house and giving them UNHCR plastic so they can cover the windows and begin to rebuild their home. And then developing reconstruction is when you give the farmer seed and you build a farmer's market so the people back in their homes can now go buy local produce instead of having it shipped in from abroad. All of that done under an umbrella of security. But in reality, what we wind up doing is we very quickly want to draw down the security because that $700 billion hammer is not made for doing this kind of work. It's made to be going out and breaking things. And this is actually the peacekeeping part. And they don't like it, and they're not good at it, and they're very, very expensive. So you see the security presence drops off very rapidly. And when that happens, what we also lose is the ability to move in those spaces. Um, the Balkan War is a great example of that. When the international military drew down in the Balkans, we very quickly lost our ability to go out and marry these communities back up and do all of that recovery and development and reconstruction work that we wanted to do. So uh, this is the next point. Unity is essential and elusive. There's a parable from the places I've worked, Central Asia actually, of six blind wise men describing an elephant. Each of them grabs a different piece of the element, elephant, and each one of them describes it accurately and truthfully, but they're all wrong, but they're all right at the same time. Their answer is only useful when you can bring the six together and have a conversation where everybody's perspectives are heard and integrated together. And that's a challenge whether you're talking about the US government, you're talking about the international community, the US military. Um, what we try for is unity of effect, and this is a military slide, it builds pretty quickly. Unity of effect requires unity of action. Unity of action requires unity of effort. Unity of effort requires a unity of vision, and that requires unity of command, and we don't have that. 
very quickly from Afghanistan. If you were a young captain in the Army working in the fields in Afghanistan and you were working with a young State Department officer, maybe in their 20s and 30s, and you're working together on this unity of action that we're trying to get to, I won't ask you to guess, I'll just tell you, your chains of command for that young State Department officer and that young military officer don't ever meet until you get to the president. At no point in their chain of command do you have a unified command that says this is what we're doing in Afghanistan. If you're in the State Department, it goes all the way up through the ambassador and then to the Secretary of State, and you're from the military, it goes up to the Joint Forces Commander, and then from there to the SecDef and to the President as well. So we lack that unity of command. Now, this is a slide, if you'll look at it for a minute, count the black dots for me on this slide and, and tell me how many you think you see. One of the challenges here is, and, and those of you who were around for Vietnam know that body counts were the thing in Vietnam. And it's because it's pretty easy to count bodies. Now we learned the hard way it's also easy to lie about it, but you tend to do the things that get counted. And a lot of times the things that get counted are just not really the things that we need to focus on, particularly in a place like Ukraine right now, where it's so much about hearts and minds and passion and loyalty and devotion. Those are not easy things to count. Anybody here who's in marketing knows how much you value having metrics and outputs of your marketing campaigns. But in this kind of work, those are hard to come by. This is the other problem. Some of the people who go into these theaters see a young maiden and some people see an old crone. And both are okay. You don't have to convince anybody to see the other. Truly savants in the field are people who can hold both of those competing images at near the same time and understand what the other person sees. I could say that's the military and the State Department, and it would be absolutely true. We go into these problems and we think we see the problem, and we're accurate, we're not lying, we're not wrong, but we don't see the problem the way the $700 million hammer sees the problem. And by the way, Congress doesn't really like it when you can't see the problem the same way. They don't, they don't like hearing those kinds of debates. So third problem, who are we? Pronouns are important. Um, working in Afghanistan for as long as I did, there were 72 countries represented in Afghanistan. There were 48 militaries represented there. So when somebody would say the international community will not stand for this, I'll say, who do you mail a postcard to with the international community? Because I'd really like to talk to them about that. There is no we to the international community. It's like the business class lounge at Heathrow Airport. A lot of people, same room, same time, same purpose, getting on a plane, but you would never walk into a business class lounge at Heathrow Airport and say, my people, it's good to have you all in a room together. <laughs> so we can't assume a community where one doesn't exist. Um, the little reference sheet I left on the table, one that I should have put on there, there um, Sam Nunn had an assistant or an employee named Jim Locker who wrote an excellent book called Victory on the Potomac. And it's about how we went from being multiple militaries, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps, to a joint military. And it was one of the most important things to happen in the last century. It was truly, truly pivotal. Um, the victory on the Potomac is how Congress did that. They forced it on our military to go from them to us. We need that now for the civilian side of government as well, to, to, to bring the military and the civilians together so that we do have that unity of command. Now, this is a slide that builds, it's a little bit snarky, but it's one that I've used in the military and the War College, talking to military officers and civilian State Department as well. Those are not quotes that I made up. Those are actual quotes about how the military see the civilians and how the civilians see the military. And now these are some of the reasons that they see things differently. Um, civilians go into these places to stay. The military goes in to get their job done and leave. In Afghanistan, when I showed up in 2002, I was astounded to learn that there were NGOs, even American NGOs, who had been there for literally decades. So the civilians have the longevity. They understand the nuances of the loyalties and the different local topographies. If you think all politics is local, all warfare is even more local when you go into places like Ukraine and like Afghanistan. So this slide is building on its own. Um, I, I've talked about a lot of contextual challenges and problems that we have. As you watch the slide build, this is kind of how it comes out. When we go to Afghanistan, we ask for X. And depending on who we ask of, and if you imagine the, the memos, there are dozens of people that are copied and infoed, and everybody gets to see the memo. Everybody defines what we've asked for differently. And, and again, none of them are necessarily wrong, but they're not all um, necessarily helpful. And this should be the summary slide. If I, there we go. So War and Peace is a long book for a reason. This is really complicated stuff. Don't think of War and Peace as kind of the yin and yang symbol. Think of it as a cake that you 
started mixing and you can't unbake it. The ingredients of war are always present during peace and the opportunities for peace are always present during war. And the word that I would layer over both of those is diplomacy. Um, I think the war is a measure of diplomacy by other means. Peace after war is especially hard. And when I turn the page, we're gonna start on the Ukraine part of this conversation. Um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a pretty good measure of what we need in a post-conflict setting. And then getting the right people in the room and getting them to agree on what we're gonna do is really, really challenging. We're, not, we're just not good at that. And finally, the pronoun parts are, are important. Now, I've raced through this. I hope I have done justice to giving you just enough to maybe pique your interest or annoy you a little bit. Um, not too much. I would like to work in this town at some point in the future. But, um, so I, I'm really a stickler, Dr. Bark. I don't like it when people argue with me when they don't know what they're talking about. When I was at Georgia Tech, I wrote a paper, and I tried to make the, and I did make the, the thesis was that people's vehemence on their opinion about Vietnam was inversely proportional to their knowledge about the country. And, and it was actually pretty easy to prove. These are some things that no one should really be able to disagree about with respect to Ukraine. A little editorial note, the Ukraine re refers to the area when it was part of the Soviet Union and the, and the Commonwealth of Independent States. It was referred to as a region, kind of like the South. Ukraine is what the country is actually called as a matter of respect. Um, and I'm not gonna read this slide to you. It's huge, it's the size of Texas. Um, the population is around 43 million people. If you look further down, the, um, that is not a typo. The average salary is around $550 a month. Um, the Humanitarian Development Index is kind of the good, uh, good housekeeping seal of approval for how countries are at taking care of their population. They're not doing great. Um, they're 74th out of about 180 countries. On the corruption, corruption perception test scale of 100, they scored 32, that's not good. Um, they're about 122nd out of 180 countries among businessmen who, do, who, who are trying to do business there. So, you know, when, when people talk about Ukraine, it is not a country without problems. It has challenges. Um, there's no question about that. But their new administration was supposed to be and has every appearance of being a breath of fresh air. Our country took a while to get our act together. We had our Articles of Confederation some 12 to 15 years after our initial Declaration of Independence. Ukraine is, is a country with tremendous potential. Some of you may have seen things on Facebook or on the internet about how much potential they have in terms of um, what they've got to in, in, uh, mineral wealth and, um, uh, and, and they are the breadbasket of Europe in many ways. Now, what I didn't put on here was one of the questions that somebody sent me in an email setting this up. What, what impact does, for example, the Budapest Memorandum have on this? The two largest nuclear arsenals in the world have been the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, I'm sorry, the U.S. and USSR, Soviet Union. The third largest was Ukraine. They had an enormous number of nuclear weapons in Ukraine. They didn't have the control codes for them, but they had the weapons. And they had the material, the fissile material. Um, the goal was when the Soviet Union fell apart for Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine, who had all this material, nuclear weapon material, we want to get that back. We don't really want to see that floating around the world, so we'd like to get that back in safe hands. And so the Budapest Memorandum were actually three memorandum, one with each of those countries, making some security assurances and some financial contributions to the states if in turn they would surrender their nuclear fissile material to the, Soviet, or to the Russians in some cases for uh, turning it into fuel rods, and in some cases we went in and got it back and we, we, we brought it back for them. Um, the, the Budapest Memorandum isn't directly relevant. I, I should also say diplomacy is, as you saw in the Ambrose Bierce, diplomacy is the tactical art of patriotically lying for your country. Uh, uh, the Budapest Memorandum is a memorandum, it's not a treaty. U.S. Congress never ratified it. Um, so it, it, the legal standing of the document is in question. There is no question that the principle has been violated. Ukraine was promised that as long as they stayed neutral, they didn't join the CIS, that they left in 2018. But if the, if the, the, nation, of the nation of Ukraine would stay independent, not in NATO, not in CIS, then they would be guaranteed security from both sides. Um, Putin violated that when he invaded and annexed the Crimean Peninsula. And, and to the bottom, if, if you don't know this stuff, the, um, this Azov Sea right here is really one big port for the Russian military, the Russian Navy. And people refer to the Black Sea as a Russian lake. If, if Russia had their way, they would own and operate the Black Sea, taking a page from China's handbook with respect to the South China Sea. They consider that still they're near abroad. That's a term from the old Cold War days. 
And they, they couldn't have the Crimean Peninsula in the hands of NATO because it so controls this little tiny strait right there. I can't even make my hand steady enough to show it well. So that mattered a lot to them. They invaded, they annexed Crimea, and now they'd like to do the same and build themselves a buffer between the rest of Europe and, and Russia here. I'll stop. If there are no questions, I'll give you back about five or 10 minutes, but if, uh, if there are questions, I'm more than happy to enter a discussion. I really thank you for your patience. I once again tried to cover two hours worth of material in about 15 minutes, but thank you for having me. Do you have any time? Yeah, we have time for Okay. Go ahead. We have time for several questions, um, so please jump in. And if you shout it out, I'll repeat the question if you, if you like, just so we don't have to do microphones. Yes, sir. What is, what is a potential exit route for Putin at this point? Yeah, so the question was, what is Putin's exit route? I don't think he has one. I, to be honest, um, there are smarter people than me who've done a lot of assessments of him, and the intelligence community is one of them. And, and there are, they all differ, but kind of the consensus of where they are is he's almost certainly using steroids to maintain his fitness. The, the Soviet Union and then Russia afterwards have been famous for doping their athletes to get more out of them. He's famous for being a martial artist, um, right up there with Steven Seagal when it comes to seriousness and capabilities, uh, which was a joke. Um, <laughs> But they're, they're, the intelligence community is pretty certain that he is using steroids, and those have consequences for your mental abilities and for your ability to control anger and rage. And they're concerned now that he is, and they also can diminish your ability to resist infection. So when you see the table settings where he's sitting at one end of a long table and everybody else is at the other end, a benign version of that is he wants to protect himself from COVID. But a more serious version might be that he is immunocompromised to some degree, and he wants to make certain that nothing happens to him, so he keeps people at that much of a distance. There isn't anyone that I've talked to, and I, this is, again, I, no longer my circus, not my monkeys, but I do stay in touch with my colleagues who work in these areas. Most of them think he only sees one way out, and that's straight ahead. That's why some of the oligarchs are beginning to make known their frustrations with that approach. And I'm sure there's all kinds of behind-the-scenes skullduggery of, of different levels of kind of malignancy with respect to how Russia can get out of this, whether Putin gets out of it or not. But it's very much focused on Vladimir Putin and what he wants to do. He has isolated his cell of senior advisors in a way that's very narcissistic and very unproductive and very unhelpful because anyone who would speak truth to power is um, not accepted at all. So, there isn't one. I think that the two ways this will end is the Ukrainians will bleed them dry the way the Afghans did some 30 years ago, and he will just have to leave because he can no longer sustain it. There was a news story yesterday. He had apparently requested military assistance from China, which China now denies, but he has not shown the, the, the Russian military to be the, the mighty military that he thought it was. And that was one of the biggest fallouts for us from Afghanistan. The myth of American military supremacy, despite our $700 billion hammer, was a bunch of Afghans kicked us out of the country after 20 years. We've now seen the same thing. The Russian military, which people were so terrified of in Eastern Europe, it ain't all that. And one of the ways that war has changed is there are now technologies available that make asymmetric warfare much, much easier. So if you're a Ukrainian housewife, and literally there are Ukrainian housewives who've been trained on how to use Javelin missiles, and we've provided the missiles, and there are Ukrainian housewives who can tank out a Russian tank. You don't have to run with a Molotov cocktail anymore up and drop it in the turret. You can stand back and use those missiles. So I think he's just gonna wind up getting his nose repeatedly bloodied until these talks can produce some sort of fig leaf that will allow him to say, okay, we've gotten what we wanted. It may be a recognition of the annexation of Crimea. The, the Ukraine government has not recognized that. He will probably want Donbass, and part of that, again, that um, far, eastern slopes of Ukraine, and I don't see the government of the Ukraine giving him that either. But I, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. Yes, sir? What's, what's your view of the internal Russian uh, opposition? The question was, what's the view of internal Russian opposition? I, I'm, I don't have an educated one. I, again, I'm the six-year-old with a soccer ball here. But what, you know, during the Soviet days, we spent a lot of time focusing on who showed up at parades and who stood where on the parapet. Um, it was called criminology, and you studied kind of who's in a position of favor and who's in a position of power. A lot of like what we do now with the DPRK with North Korea. We study every picture to see who's where. Putin has so isolated himself 
that it's Putin and his immediate circle of cronies who he chooses to listen to, and that's it. So I think the opposition are operating, and they are growing, and they are able to speak in the vacuum as long as nobody hears their voices. I think when the opportunity comes, we will find the opposition is there and ready. But I unfortunately, yet, unless somebody's seen something I haven't, there is no credible source that tells me there is a serious alternative to just following President Putin right now. And that's horrible. Yes, ma'am. On the, 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 yeah, the very back, the, yeah, thank you. Um, one of the things that's really different about this from my observation of history is the role of the corporation. You've talked a lot about the State Department and, and the military. Um, and from my chair watching international companies who have operations in Ukraine or Poland or Hungary or, or Russia, and their behavior is just extraordinary, both in the rescue effort, the you know, maintenance of Ukrainian people effort, and uh, they're real actors, and they're acting very quietly um, and not issuing press releases. But I'd love for you to comment on that. Well, that's um, a great point. And I, actually, again, I, I've given a little more time, another hour or two. One of the things I talk about is the evolution of warfare from then to now. And, and there are more international corporations now than there are single nation corporations. Another book, I can't remember the author's name, but the title of the book is called Ghost Fleet. And it's a novel written by two military strategists, really, really good novel, well grounded in uh, the realities of the past decade. And they make the point in, in that particular uh, book, the China attacks the US in a number of ways, and it's the corporations that save us. Um, the US military has the same kind of logistical problems that the Russian military is having in Ukraine. And I, I can't remember if it's Google or Amazon or, but anyway, Responsible corporate actors who are willing to be corporate citizens, I'm sorry, national, global citizens. Responsible corporate actors who are willing to be global citizens first are, I think, in many ways, going to be the, the wave of the future and maybe the salvation of getting out of situations like what we're facing in Ukraine right now. Great question. Yes, ma'am. So for someone who suffered from uh, a malignant personality disorder the way Putin seems to, and now you're mentioning steroids. The, the other option that he may be seeing to put an end to um, all of this is the threat of nuclear weapons. How serious is that? I know he sent them to the highest um, alert possible, um, and I know Zelensky said he's a murderer, not um, suicidal, but I don't find great comfort in whether or not he's being rational, and could he, in fact, do something nuclear? And I, um, that's a great question, and I, I'm not qualified to answer, but of course I will. Um, I think all of us who work in this field worry about nuclear escalation. Um, the, the question around the, um, the uh, various treaties and non-proliferation treaties that we've signed to get nuclear weapons into the hands of responsible adults. We didn't see this coming when we did that. Um, you may know that during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the one thing that saved us from a nuclear conflict then was a particular Politburo officer on a particular submarine who they had gotten a message to launch their weapons and he said, that can't be right, we're not doing that. Had he acquiesced, as he was expected to, they would have launched nuclear weapons during the, during the Cold War. So we can't say that nuclear engagement is not possible and not likely. Putin is very much a kleptocrat, and the oligarchs around him, the people advising him, are incredibly wealthy. I mean, more wealthy than any of us in this room can imagine, even though I'm sure there are some here who are well off. The amount of money that they have uh, rapaciously taken from the state just boggles the mind. But is, there's no value in having a $100 million yacht or a $500 million yacht if the ocean is boiling around you and you don't have a place to sail it. So I, I think there are enough realists who understand the consequences of nuclear conflict um, to keep that from happening. Now, what you didn't ask is biological and chemical weapons, which are kind of a half step down. They are still classified as weapons of mass destruction. There are still treaties in place about how that'll be handled if they're used. You know, a lot of us thought we were right on the cusp of that when they isolated and damaged Chernobyl and took the power out at the Chernobyl nuclear plant. And then the next largest nuclear power plant down the river, they did the same thing. A nuclear disaster at one of those plants in Ukraine would have consequences for all of Europe. Um, the question was, do we consider that a nuclear incident? I think we're all doing everything we can to keep from going that route. And that's an important question too, and I'll make this point. You know, President Biden has not been as aggressive as I would have liked 
uh, to be honest, in terms of U.S. support to Ukraine. He gets a much better reading folder than I do, and his team does not play six-year-old on the soccer field. They're looking at the whole thing. But first and foremost in their mind is making sure this does not become a confrontation between the United States and Russia, because that very quickly could go nuclear. In fact, there aren't many ways for it not. They can't invade us. We can't invade them. So if we start trading body blows with the other nuclear superpower on the, on the planet, that doesn't end well for anyone. So we're looking for ways that we can use surrogates, whether it's the Poles, the Hungarians, others in the area. We're looking for ways that we can find track two diplomacy to talk to people around Putin. Even though I said there aren't many, we're looking for them and trying to find ways to offer him ways out. Um, but nobody wants it to get to the point. I, I think it's right to be worried about it. It's one of those things that there's nothing we can do about. And, and I mean, short of, as Dr. Bark was saying, buying canned goods and hi hiding under our desks. We, we don't have a dog in that fight, so to speak. We just have to suffer the consequences if it goes there. And right now, I think everyone is working to make sure it doesn't go there. Oh, boy. So the question was, how do we, how do we get from the various we's to a true joint us? Uh, so Jim Walker's... Um, the, the Project on National Security Reform. So if you look up uh, PNSR, Project on National Security Reform, when Jim Walker retired from working for Sam Nunn, he saw that what he had done for the military that created the Joint Chiefs of Staff and created one U.S. military, we needed to do that for the U.S. government. When we go to Ukraine or when we go to Afghanistan, we can't have these separate chains of command, and he saw that. And he had something called the Project for National Security Reform. Colin Powell was kind of the co-author for helping to stand that up, and it died. And it died in Washington. I was actually the, the, the um, deputy coordinator for something called the Secretary's Civilian Response Corps. It was supposed to be State Department officials who had a military background like mine, who were comfortable going out without all the protections. And we were, we were able to work with our military so we could begin to integrate our military mailed fist, the 700 billion hammer, with the ability to do things that didn't require a hammer. It died because there were forces at State Department and in the Defense Department who didn't want to see that done. And it's just, and Jim Walker in, the, in that book, Victory on the Potomac, it's a thick book because he talks about how fiercely the services fought against being drawn into a joint military. Every one of the services fought it. Nobody wanted it. Now, 40 years later, everybody's really glad we have it. So we haven't had yet the political gravitas. Our, our Congress is somewhat divided. Um, we haven't had the political gravitas to center around this and say we really need to get to this point. It's still there. Jim Walker hasn't died yet. PNSR is kind of on the shelf waiting for someone to have the political will to dust it off and pull it out. But thank you very much, and that's a great question to end on. I really appreciate the chance to come talk to you, and I hope uh, it's been of some value to you today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Joel. Um, thank you so much. That was incredible. And thank you especially for your service to our country. Uh, we remember your prior program on Afghanistan, and I think we all left feeling that it was a bit of lightning in a bottle. And it is just the same today. I can tell we, we could go on for multiple hours with all of the incredible knowledge packed in your brain. So thank you for making us all a much better informed group today. Um, Next week, I will be traveling out of the country. I'm very grateful that President-elect Stephanie will be covering for me. We have another fascinating program uh, with Andrew Filer and Doug Hooker talking about the history of the 5,000 Rosenwald schools that were built for African-American children around the South in the 1900s. So I know you won't want to miss that program as well. Hope you all have a wonderful week. Thank you so much. <laughs>